here real quick. <laughs> All right, kiddos. So we're in it for two more chapters. Okay, we're gonna be um, in chapter seven and eight. So let's recap what we know so far. So we know Stanley supposedly stole a pair of Clyde Sweet Feet Livingston sneakers, right? He says that they fell from the sky, but really he was walking under a bridge. Um, maybe someone threw them off the bridge. Maybe they fell, we're not really sure. Um, we just know that Stanley didn't do it. However, that's why he was sent to Camp Green Lake. And we know that at Camp Green Lake, there is no lake. Um, the boys dig holes. Remember, they're five feet deep and five feet wide. And remember, kiddos, I'm five four. So think about a hole that's about this deep, where the only thing you could see if I was standing in it would be the top of my head, right? That's a really deep hole. Um, so our focus today is going to be on motivation. Now that's something that we've talked a lot about, especially when we were doing um, the lightning thief. We talked a lot about motivation. If you have trouble remembering what motivation is, um, or through this you seem like you're struggling a little bit, go watch my lesson on Google Classroom. It's literally called character motivation. Okay, so we know that motivation is the reason why a character thinks, acts, feels, or speaks a certain way. We know characters have traits, right? It's how they're thinking, acting, feeling, and speaking. And so motivation is why. Why are they thinking that way? What's making them act that way? What caused them to feel this way? And why are they saying the words that they're saying? Okay, and so we have to ask ourselves these questions. What does the character want? And why are they making those choices? So that's gonna kind of lend to our essential question today. We're gonna need a character named Elia, okay? And the question that we're really gonna be focusing on is what does Elia want? And how does this make him think, act, feel, and speak, okay? What does he want and how does it influence how he's thinking, acting, feeling, and speaking? So like always, at the end of this lesson, you're gonna have a graphic organizer to fill out. If you feel like you're struggling with that graphic organizer at any point in time, please let me know or go back and watch my video because I fill out a graphic organizer just like the one I'm asking you to fill out. And then there will be a question on Google Classroom um, after this um, for you to respond to and respond back to your classmates. Okay? So we are in chapters seven and eight today. Um, I'm starting on page 26 for those of you who are gonna follow along with me in your book. And I definitely recommend that you do because your graphic organizer today asks you to use text evidence. And we know text evidence comes word for word out of the book. Okay, so when any point on your graphic organizer, if it says use text evidence, make sure that you're going back in your book and doing that. So what I recommend today is that you follow along with me and anytime you hear an answer to the question on the graphic organizer that you've got, I would pause the video and I would answer that question and then maybe come back to me, okay? Um, the first question it's gonna ask you today is this one, what does Elia want? And then you're gonna spend the rest of the graphic organizer talking about how it influences how he's thinking, acting, feeling, and speaking. It's a little warm in here, I'm gonna turn my fan on. Sorry, got a little warm. All right, kiddos, we are on chapter seven. We are on page 26. The shovel felt heavy in Stanley's soft, fleshy hands. He tried to jam it in the earth, but the blade banged against the ground and bounced off without making a dent. The vibration ran up the shaft of the shovel and into Stanley's wrists, making his bones rattle. It was still dark. The only light came from the moon and stars, more stars than Stanley had ever seen before. It seemed he had only just gotten to sleep when Mr. Pendansky came in and woke everyone up. Do you remember what time they had to get up? 4.30, it's super early, right? They get up that early so they can have breakfast and they can dig as long as they can before the sun comes out. Because remember in like chapter one, it said that it's like 95 degrees in the shade. So we can probably go ahead and assume it's over 100 degrees every day out there digging that hole. Okay, so they wanna be up early before the sun comes out. Using all his might, he broke, brought the shovel back down onto the dry lake bed. The force stung his hands, but made, made no impression on the earth. He wondered if he had a defective shovel. He glanced at Zero, about 15 feet away, who had scooped out a shovel full of dirt and dumped it in a pile that was already almost a foot tall. For breakfast, they'd been served some kind of lukewarm cereal. I'm gonna go ahead and assume here that the food at Camp Green Lake's not good either. The best part was the orange juice. They got a big carton. The cereal actually didn't taste too bad, but it smelled a lot like his cot. Remember, who slept on his cot? Bark bag. <laughs> then they filled their canteens, got their shovels, and were marched out across the lake. Each group was assigned a different area. The shovels were kept in a shed near the showers. 
They all looked the same to Stanley, although X-Ray had his own special shovel, which no one was allowed to use. X-Ray claimed that it was shorter than the others, but if it was, it was only by a fraction of an inch. The shovels were five feet long from the tip of the steel blade to the end of the wooden shaft. Stanley's hole would have to be as deep as his shovel, and he'd have to be able to lay the shovel flat across the bottom in any direction. That was why X-Ray wanted the, sh the shortest shovel. The lake was so full of holes and mounds that it reminded Stanley of pictures he'd seen of the moon. If you find anything interesting or unusual, Mr. Pendansky had told him, you should report it to either me or Mr. Sir when we come around with the water truck. If the warden likes what you found, you get the rest of the day off. What are we supposed to be looking for? Stanley asked him. You're not looking for anything. You're digging to build character. It's just if you find anything, the warden would like to know. He glanced helplessly at the shovel. It wasn't defective. He was defective. What does that mean? If it's defective, it means it doesn't work. So when he's saying the shovel's not the problem, he is. Now, how do you think that makes Stanley feel about himself? When he's calling himself defective, I mean, that shows us that he doesn't have a whole lot of self-confidence. I'm on the top of page 28. He noticed a thin crack in the ground. He placed the point of the shovel on top of it then jumped on the back of the blade with both feet. The shovel sank, sank, the shovel sank a few inches into the packed earth. He smiled. For once in his life, it paid to be overweight. He leaned on the shaft and pried up the first shovel full of dirt, then dumped it off to the side. Only 10 million more to go, he thought, then placed the shovel back in the crack and jumped on it again. He unearthed several shovelfuls of dirt in this manner. Before it occurred to him that he was dumping his dirt within the perimeter of his hole. He laid his shovel flat on the ground, marked the edges of his hole, marked the marked where the edges of his hole would be. Five feet was awfully wide. He moved the dirt he'd already dug up past his mark. He took a drink from his canteen. Five feet would be awfully deep too. The digging got easier after a while. The ground was hardest at the surface, where the sun had baked a crust about eight inches deep. Beneath that, the earth was looser. But by the time Stanley broke past the crust, a blister had formed in the middle of his right thumb, and it hurt to hold up the shovel. So if you're following along with me, you're noticing a lot of these breaks um, as we read, and we know we've talked about this, it's passing of time, um, but in holes, it's also going to mark a shift in the story. Um, Lewis Satcher, who is our author, um, really likes to go back and forth between the past and the present. And so we stay with Stanley a lot at Camp Green Lake. That's where Stanley's gonna be throughout the entirety of this book. But we're gonna jump back in time to his past. We've already seen him at court. Um, we're gonna jump back in time and see stories about his family. Um, and so sometimes when you see this mark here, we know that we're about to get another story from Stanley's background. But that's all part of Stanley's perspective, gaining his background knowledge. Stanley's great-great-grandfather was named Elia Yelnats. Oh, there's our character that we're looking for. He was born in Latvia. When he was 15 years old, he fell in love with Mira Minke. He didn't know he was Stan. He didn't know that he was going to be Stanley's great-great-grandfather. Mira Minke was 14. She would turn 15 in two months, at which time her father had decided she should be married. Elia went to her father to ask for her hand, but so did Igor Barkov, the pig farmer. Igor was 57 years old. He had a red nose and fat, puffy cheeks. I will trade you my fattest pig for your daughter, Igor offered. What have you got? Myra's father asked Elia. A heart full of love, Elia said. I'd rather have a fat pig, said Mira's father. Desperate, Elia went to see Madame Zeroni an old Egyptian woman who lived on the edge of town. He'd become friends with her, though she was quite a bit older than him. She was even older than Igor Barkov. The other boys of his village liked to mud wrestle. Elia preferred, preferred visiting Madame Zeroni and listening to her many stories. Madame Zeroni had dark skin and a very wide mouth. When she looked at you, her eyes seemed to expand and you felt like she was looking right through you. Elia, what's wrong? She asked before he even told her he was upset. She was sitting in a homemade wheelchair. She had no left foot. Her legs stopped at her ankle. I'm in love with Mira Minke, Elia confessed. 
But Eeyore Barkoff has offered to trade his fattest pig for her. You can't compete with that. Good, said Madame Zeroni. You're too young to get married. You've got your whole life ahead of you. But I love Mira. Mira's head is as empty as a flower pot. What does that mean, her head is as empty as a flower pot? Hmm, let's see if we find, can find out. But she's beautiful, said Elia. So is a flower pot. Can she push a plow? Can she milk a goat? No, she is too delicate. Can she have an intelligent conversation? No, she is silly and foolish. Will she take care of you when you are sick? No, she is spoiled and will only want you to take care of her. So she is beautiful. So what? So what do you think it means that her head is as empty as a flower pot? I mean, she's kind of stupid, right? Madame Zeroni spat on the dirt. So She told Elia that she would go to America. Like my son, that's where your future lies, not with Mira Minky. But Elia would hear none of it. He was 15 and all he could see was Mira's shallow beauty. Madame Zeroni hated to see Elia so forlorn. Against her better judgment, she agreed to help him. It just so happens my sow, which is a female pig, gave birth to a litter of piglets yesterday, she said. There is one little runt whom she won't suckle. You may have him, he'll die anyway. Madame Zeroni led Elia around the back of her house where she kept her pigs. So are we getting a sense of what Elia wants? Okay, I want you to keep thinking about that as we go through this part. Elia took the tiny piglet, but he didn't see what good it would do him. He wasn't much bigger than a rat. He'll grow, Madame Zeroni assured him. Do you see that mountain on the edge of the forest? Yes, said Elia. On the top of the mountain, there is a stream where the water runs uphill. You must carry the piglet every day to the top of the mountain and let it drink from the stream. As it drinks, you are to sing to him. She taught Elia a special song to sing to the pig. On the day of Mira's 15th birthday, you should carry the pig up the mountain for the last time. Then take it directly to Mira's father. It will be fatter than any of Igor's pigs. If it is that big and fat, said Elia, how will I be able to carry it up the mountain? The piglet is not too heavy for you now, is he? asked Madame Zeroni. Of course not, said Elia. Do you think it will be too heavy for you tomorrow? No. Every day you will carry the pig up the mountain. It will get a little bigger, but you will get a little bit stronger. After you give the pig to Mira's father, I want you to do one more thing for me. Anything, said Elia. I want you to carry me up the mountain. I want to drink from the stream, and I want you to sing the song to me. Elia promised he would. Not a bad deal, right? Carry the pig up the mountain every day and he gets to marry the person that he loves. Madame Zeroni. Here's the trick. Madame Zeroni warned that if he failed to do this, he and his descendants would be doomed for all eternity. Think about what they call Stanley's great, great grandfather. At the time, Elia thought nothing of the curse. He was just a 15 year old kid and eternity didn't seem much longer than a week from Tuesday. Besides, he liked Madame Zeroni and we'd be glad to carry her up the mountain. He would have done it right then and there, but he wasn't strong enough yet. So now we're shifting again. You see our break here. Stanley was still digging. His hole was about three feet deep, but only in the center. It sloped upward at the edges. The sun had only just come up over the horizon, but he could already feel the hot rays on his face. I'm on the top of 32. As he reached down to pick up his canteen, he felt a sudden rush of dizziness and put his hands on his knees to steady himself. For a moment, he was afraid he would throw up, but the moment passed. He drank the last drop of water from his canteen. He had blisters on every one of his fingers and one in the center of each palm. So think about that. He said he was about to throw up and his cart smelled like cereal. Cart, his cot smelled like cereal. What do you think they thought about the guy named Barf Bag, hmm? Everyone else's hole was a lot deeper than his. He couldn't actually see their holes, but could tell by the size of their dirt piles. He saw a cloud of dust moving across the wasteland and noticed that the other boys had stopped digging and were watching it too. The dirt cloud moved closer and he could see that it trailed behind a red pickup truck. The truck stopped near where they were digging and the boys lined up behind it. X-ray in front, zero at the rear. Stanley got in line behind zero. Mr. Sir filled each of their canteens from a tank of water in the bed of the pickup. 
As he took Stanley's canteen from him, he said, this isn't Girl Scouts, is it? Stanley raised and lowered one shoulder. Mr. Sir followed Stanley back to his hole to see how he was doing. You better get with it, he said, or else you're gonna be digging in the hottest part of the day. He popped some sunflower seeds in his mouth, deftly removed the shells with his teeth and spat them into Stanley's hole. So we're shifting, so we're going back to Elia. Every day, Elia carried the little piglet up the mountain and sang to it as it drank from the stream. As the pig grew fatter, Elia grew stronger. On the day of Mira's 15th birthday, Elia's pig weighed over 50 stones. Madame Zeroni told him to carry the pig up the mountain on that day as well, but Elia didn't want to present himself to Mira smelling like a pig. Instead, he took a bath. It was his second bath in less than a week. Then he led the pig to Mira's. Igor Barkov was there with his pig as well. These are two of the finest pigs I've ever seen, Mira's father declared. He was also impressed with Elia, who seemed to have grown bigger and stronger in the last two months. I used to think you were a good-for-nothing book reader, he said, but I see now that you would be an excellent mud rustler. May I marry your daughter? Elia boldly asked. First, I must weigh the pigs. Alas, Poor Elia should have carried the pig up the mountain one last time. Two pigs weighed exactly the same. Shift. Stanley's blister had ripped open and new blisters formed. He kept changing his grip on the shovel to try to avoid the pain. Finally, he removed his cap and held it between the shaft of, of his shovel and his raw hands. This helped, but digging was harder because the cap would slip and slide. The sun beat down on his unprotected head and neck. Though he tried to convince himself otherwise, he'd been aware for a while that his piles of dirt were too close to his hole. The piles were outside his five foot circle, but he could see he was gonna run out of room. Still, he pretended otherwise and he kept adding more dirt to the piles, piles that he was eventually gonna have to move. The problem was that when the dirt was in the ground, it was compacted. It expanded when it was excavated. So what that means is that before he dug it out of the ground, it was kind of smaller because it was all tightly compacted together. But once it was on top of the hole, sitting out on the edge, there was a big pile of dirt because it had room to spread out. The piles were a lot bigger than the hole was deep. It was either now or later. Reluctantly, he climbed up out of his hole and once again, dug his shovel into his previously dug dirt. So not only is Stanley having to dig his hole, but this is twice now that he's had to get out of his hole and move the dirt he's already dug up. So Stanley definitely has a ways to go before he learns how to dig a hole and not waste all this time. Mira's father got down on his hands and knees and closely examined each pig, tail to snout. These are two of the finest pigs I've ever seen, he said. How am I to decide? I only have one daughter. Why not let Mira decide, suggested Elia. That's preposterous, exclaimed Igor, expelling saliva as he spoke. Myra is just an empty-headed girl, said her father. How can she possibly decide when I, her father, can't? But she knows how she feels in her heart, said Elia. Ooh. Mira's father rubbed his chin. Then he laughed and said, why not? He slapped Elia on the back. It doesn't matter to me. A pig is a pig. He summoned his daughter. Elia blushed when Mira entered the room. Good afternoon, Mira, he said. She looked at him. You're Elia, right? She asked. Mira, said your fa her father. Elia and Igor have each offered a pig for your hand in marriage. Doesn't matter to me, a pig is a pig. So I will let you make the choice. Whom do you wish to marry? Who do you think she's gonna say? Mira looked confused. You want me to decide? That's right, my blossom, said her father. Gee, I don't know, said Mira. Which pig weighs more? They both weigh the same, said her father. Golly, said Mira. I guess I choose Elia. No, Igor. No, Elia. No, Igor. Oh, I know. I'll think of a number between one and ten. I'll marry whoever guesses the closest number. Okay, I'm ready. Ten, guessed Igor. Elia said nothing. Elia, said Mira, what number do you guess? Elia didn't pick a number. Mary Igor, he muttered, can keep my pig as a wedding present. So Elia does all of that, and when it comes down to it, he is upset. Why? What did he expect Mira to 
instantly do when she was given the choice. The next time the water truck came, it was driven by Mr. Pendansky, who also brought staff lunches. Stanley sat with his back against a pile of dirt and ate. He had a bologna sandwich with potato chips and a large chocolate chip cookie. How you doing? asked Magnet. Not real good, said Stanley. Well, the first hole's the hardest, said Magnet. Stanley took a long, deep breath. He couldn't afford to dawdle. He was way behind the others, and the sun just kept getting hotter. It wasn't even noon yet, but he didn't know if he had the strength to stand up. He thought about quitting. He wondered what they would do to him. What could they do to him? His clothes were soaked with sweat. In school, he had learned that sweating was good for you. It was nature's way of keeping you cool. So why was he still so hot? Using the shovel for support, he managed to get to his feet. Where are we supposed to go to the bathroom? He asked Magnet. Magnet gestured with his arms to the great expanse around them. Pick a hole, any hole, he said. Stanley staggered across the lake, almost falling over a dirt pile. Behind him, he heard Magnet say, make sure nothing's living in it. After leaving Mira's house, Elia wandered aimlessly through the town until he found himself down by the wharf. Um, that's like the dock on the edge of the coast where the ships come in to trade like fish and goods and all that kind of stuff. He sat on the edge of a pier and stared down into the cold black water. He could not understand how Mira had trouble deciding between him and Igor. He thought she loved him. Even if she didn't love him, couldn't she see what a foul person Igor was? It was like Madame Zeroni had said, her head was as empty as a flower pot. Some men were gathered around another dock and he went to see what was going on. A sign read, deck hands wanted free passage to America. He had no sailing experience, but the ship's captain signed him aboard. The captain could see that Elliot was a man of great strength. Not everybody could carry a full grown pig up the side of a mountain. It wasn't until the ship had cleared the hard had sh the ship had cleared the harbor and was heading out across the Atlantic that he suddenly remembered his promise to Madame Zeroni up, on, up the mountain. Mm. His promise to carry Madame Zeroni up the mountain. He felt terrible. He wasn't afraid of the curse. He thought that was just a lot of nonsense. He fell back because he knew Madame Zeroni had wanted to drink from the stream before she died. Zero was the smallest kid in Group D, but he was the first one to finish digging. Finish? Stanley asked enviously. Zero said nothing. Stanley walked to Zero's hole and watched him measure it with his shovel. The top of his hole was a perfect circle, and the sides were smooth and steep. Not one dirt clod more than necessary had been removed from the earth. Zero pulled himself up to the surface. He didn't even smile. He looked down at his perfectly dug hole, spat in it, and then turned, his head, turned and headed back to the camp compound. Zero's one weird dude, said Zigzag. Stanley would have laughed, but he didn't have the strength. Zigzag had to be the weirdest dude Stanley had ever seen. He had a long skinny neck and a big round head with wild frizzy blonde hair that stuck out in all sorts of directions. His head seemed to bob up and down on his neck like he was on a spring. Armpit was the second one to finish digging. He also spat in his hole before heading back to keep the camp calm down. One by one, Stanley watched each of the boys spit into their hole and return to the camp compound. Stanley just kept digging. His hole was almost up to his shoulders, although it was hardly, it was hard to tell exactly where ground level was because his dirt piles, because his dirt piles completely surrounded the hole. The deeper he got, the harder it was to raise the dirt up out of the hole. Once again, he realized he was gonna have to move the piles. This is three times he's gotta move his piles. His cap was stained with blood from his hands. He felt like he was digging his own grave. What does that mean? He felt like he was digging his own grave. Hey, he felt like he was gonna die out there, that this was just a hole they were gonna throw him in when he was done. In America, Elia learned to speak English. He fell in love with a woman named Sarah Miller. She could push a plow, milk a goat, and most important, think for herself. She and Elia often stayed up half the night talking and laughing together. Their life was not easy. Elia worked hard, but bad luck seemed to follow him everywhere. He always seemed to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. He remembered Madame Zeroni telling him that she had a son in America. Elia was forever looking for him. He'd walk up to complete strangers and asked if they knew someone, knew someone named Zeroni or had ever heard of anyone named Zeroni. 
No one did. Elliot wasn't sure what he'd do if he ever found Madame's Ronnie's son anyway. Carry him up the mountain and sing the pig lullaby? After his barn was struck by lightning for the third time, he told Sarah about his broken pro promise to Madame Zeroni. I'm worse than a pig thief, he said. You should leave me and find someone who isn't cursed. I'm not leaving you, said Sarah, but I want you to do one thing for me. Anything, said Elia. Sarah smiled. Sing me the pig lullaby. He sang for her. Her eyes sparkled. That's so pretty, what does it mean? Elia tried his best to translate it from a Latvian into English, but it just wasn't the same. It rhymes in Latvian, he told her. I could tell, said Sarah. A year later, their child was born. Sarah named him Stanley because she noticed that Stanley was Yelnats spelled backwards. Sarah changed the words in the pig lullaby so that they rhymed, and every night she sang it to little Stanley. If only, if only the woodpecker sighs, the bark on the tree was as soft as the skies, while the wolf waits below, hungry and lonely, crying to the moon. If only, if only, we've heard that before, haven't we? Stanley's hole was as deep as his shovel, but not quite wide enough on the bottom. He grimaced as he sliced off a chunk of dirt and then raised it up and flung it onto the pile. He laid his shovel down on the bottom of the hole and to his surprise, it fit. He rotated it and only had to chip a few chunks off few chunks of dirt off here and there before it could lie fat, flat across his hole in every direction. He heard the water truck approaching and felt a strange sense of pride at being able to show Mr. Sir or Mr. Pendansky that he had dug his first hole. He put his hands on the rim and tried to pull himself up. He couldn't do it. His arms were too weak to lift his heavy body. He used his legs to help, but he just didn't have any strength. He was trapped in his hole. It was almost funny, but he wasn't in the mood to laugh. Stanley, he heard Mr. Pendansky call. Using his shovel, he dug two foot holes in the hole wall. He climbed out to see Mr. Pendansky walking over to him. I was afraid you'd faint it, Mr. Pendansky said. You wouldn't have been the first. I'm finished, said Stanley, putting his blood spotted cap back on his head. All right, said Mr. Pendansky, raising his hand for a high five, but Stanley ignored it. He didn't have the strength. Mr. Pendansky lowered his hand and looked down at Stanley's hole. Well done, he said. You want to ride back? Stanley shook his head. I'll walk. Why do you think he'd walk? I wouldn't want to walk. I don't want to get in the car and, and ride back. So why do you think Stanley decided to walk? Hmm. Mr. Pendansky climbed back into the truck without filling Stanley's canteen. Stanley waited for him to drive away, then took another look at his hole. He knew it was nothing to be proud of, but he felt proud nonetheless. He sucked up his last bit of saliva and spat. Okay, chapter eight, this is a quick one, 41. A lot of people don't believe in curses. A lot of people don't believe in yellow spotted lizards either, but if one bites you, it doesn't make a difference whether you believe in it or not. Actually, it's kind of odd that scientists name the lizard after its yellow spots. Each lizard has exactly 11 yellow spots but the spots are hard to see on its yellow-green body. The lizard is from six to 10 inches long and has big red eyes. In truth, its eyes are yellow. It's the skin around the eyes, which is red, but everyone always speaks of its red eyes. It also has black teeth and a milky white tongue. Looking at one, you would have thought it should have been named something like red-eyed lizard or black-tooth lizard, or perhaps a white-tongue lizard. If you've ever been close enough to see the yellow spots, you're probably dead. The yellow spotted lizard live, like to live in holes, which offer shade from the sun and protection from predatory birds. Up to 20 lizards may live in one hole. They have strong, powerful legs and can leap out of the very deep holes to attack their prey. They eat small animals, insects, certain cactus thorns, and shells from sunflower seeds. All right, kiddos. So remember, your assignment is going to be to um, go to the next slide and work on your graphic organizer, which is gonna tackle this right here, motivation. And these are your questions that we were focusing on as we read. What did Elia want and how did it make him think, act, feel, and speak? Okay, remember, because 
motivation is the reason why a character thinks, acts, feels, or speaks a certain way. Okay? So great job. I love you guys. I miss you guys. Um, if you're struggling with this, go back and watch my mini lesson over character motivation. Um, send me a message through Remind. Put a post in the group Facebook chat. Whatever you need, just let me know. And then don't forget to post on our book discussion on Google Classroom. Okay, see you guys later.